Our thought leaders are Dave Sussman and Lewis Medcalf. Dave is a registered architect, certified construction specifier, and founding principal of Conspectus, a specifications and quality assurance consulting firm. Uh, Dave will be the C um, Dave will, I'm not sure, um, actually. Um, Dave, you spoke at the recent uh, Specifier Academy again this year, correct? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and is a speaker at a lot of CSI events um, throughout the year and chapters around the area. Uh, Lewis is also an architect and certified construction specifier. Lewis manages the specifications and quality assurance programs for Gresham Smith & Partners, a national architectural, engineering, interiors, and planning firm. Um, and in case you haven't heard, Lewis is from the national area and is anxiously awaiting you all to come down for Construct this fall um, and listen to his mandolin and other miscellaneous string uh, instrument playing skills. Um, so with that, I want to hand it off to Dave and Lewis to do any introductions or get going with today's presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. This is Dave, and I'm coming to you from southern New Jersey. And Lewis is coming from Nashville, I suppose you are today, right? <laughs> That's right, downtown Nashville. Okay, and so the topic today is specifications then and now. And Lewis and I have actually had some fun trying to put all of this together. We've discovered some really interesting things that hopefully as we go through this you'll find interesting too. And Lewis, I, I don't you captured this image here on the lead in screen and I'm not sure uh, what this is from. So you want to fill us in? This is the uh, Cincinnati Art Museum, the original construction that was built in the early 1880s and we're going to see an excerpt from the specifications for that that was uh, that were issued for bid in 1883. One of your projects, I guess. And <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, the the firm I worked for in Cincinnati for many years uh, did a major addition to uh, the art museum, and uh, in so doing, somehow we got a hold of some photocopies of those original specifications that uh, I'm going to share with with the group today and uh, they're they're really interesting as I, I think you'll see. Okay, so we're going to take a step back in time, huh? Yes. And we are going to start in the 1800s, the 19th century, where there were really no particular standards and for most of the, the period that we're going to be talking about today, uh, although they had the concept of kind of dividing the material up according to products or trade groups or what, whatever, they didn't have the idea of, of grouping related portions of work into divisions as such. So uh, we don't have uh, that. If you go to the next slide, please, Dave. Well, I can try. See what I can do for you. And um, in the early days, there was no numbering of paragraphs either. And uh, if you go to the next slide, I need so how, how how in the world did they ever keep track of anything? That's an excellent question. Of course, they were pretty short, but mostly they just uh, uh, used um, you know little indents at the beginning of paragraphs, which I failed to transcribe in this. But here's an, a sample. Interestingly enough, a lot of the specifications also have to in these early days had to describe where products were as well as the types of products. And um, you'll notice in, here in the second paragraph, uh, the Philadelphia enameled bricks. And uh, I was going to ask you, uh, David, since you live in that area, is that a brand name or was that a, a generic type of enameled bricks? Well, I don't recognize the name at all, and certainly I don't believe it's a brand name, and I would expect that it might mean something to do with either a, a coating on the brick or some way of firing the brick to get that enameled look. Yeah, I'm sure it was a fired enamel. I, I, I believe I remember seeing those. 
it's uh, been I haven't lived in Cincinnati since 1995, so it's been a while since I've looked at that building. Um, <clears throat> there are some references to uh, Louisville cement and to Springfield lime, and again, it's not clear whether those references are to a type of cement and type of lime or to an actual manufacturer's name. Let's go to the next slide. One of the things that strikes you about these early documents is, the, is this emphasis on judgment and authority rather than strict interpretation and, uh, of written documents. Not that they didn't, there were written documents, but let's go to the, actually the sample from this 1883 spec and see what it says. All right. Is that the one you're talking about? That's the one I'm talking about. So, final arbiter. I assume the superintendent here is employed by the architect. And another quaint term for that was the clerk of the works. But um, it had to be to their satisfaction not to what was shown on the drawings or intended by the drawings or indicated on the drawings and specs, but to satisfaction. And one runs into that uh, uh, from time to time in, in other uh, examples that, from that period. Let's go on. Incidentally, the sure. ads, ads that we've got sprinkled through this presentation are from a um, magazine that was published in the 1920s that we'll be talking about shortly. And originally, the specifications were written out longhand, and there was no inexpensive way of reproducing them. It was you know, too expensive to have them typeset. Let's go to the actual uh, sample here, David. A portion of the lime, the spec for the limestone masonry. And I have to say, the guy should have lettered it because it's not overly legible. He, I, granted, this was uh, a PDF made from a, or I should say, a JPEG made from a PDF made from a rather poor photocopy. But even so, there are, uh, I found parts of it difficult to read, even though I'm used to reading old, uh, old script. Um, but this gives you an idea of what it looked like. And there were, there are places where you can see there where a word was added, to thoroughly mixed with a carrot, and other places where things were crossed out or things written in the margin. You asked earlier about how did how could they keep the paragraph straight if we didn't have numbers. And one of the things that this set of specs did, I don't know about others, is it was written on um, uh, legal size paper, and there was a ruled line for this margin. And out to the side, there would be uh, subheadings. So under limestone masonry and under the brick masonry, there would be uh, subheadings for mortar or one thing or another to try to help uh, bidders and, con and contractors find the information that they were needing. But apparently, there was only one copy of the specs. And so uh, the contractors would have to go to the architect's office or wherever it was that these things were on display to be able to uh, make the notes that they needed to develop their bids. Let's go to the next one, please. Sure. I'm happy to be the driver today. You're doing a great job. <laughs> and uh, uh, Sheldon was kind enough to send uh, this example of now we're into the early 20th century, some actual type specifications. But again, you can see that there were some last minute emendations. And again, these apparently were not reproduced. Although, um, would you like to know that the, the um, mimeograph machine was actually invented by Thomas Edison. And so it was available towards the late 1800s, but maybe it was too expensive to use. I'm well, sure not in common use. <laughs> hey, not I, in common use. 
I, I see uh, one thing that they did add in this example, though. Yes. They have a paragraph number. Right. They have a paragraph number, right, for face brick laying, how to lay it. And, but even that has separate paragraphs underneath it, and so I think that paragraph would be more analogous to our present-day article headings. Yeah, but at least now you have a reference to get to a point in the document. Yes, you do. If, if you needed it. Yes. Let's go to the next one, please. Now we're going to jump forward in time. And uh, in researching this thing, I, I have a textbook called um, Architectural Practice that was published in 1947. And in it, there was an intriguing reference to the American Specification Institute. That's specification singular, as you see it printed here. And um, uh, so following up on that, I did some internet searches. And I turned up Google digitized an entire year of a magazine called the American Architect Dash, the Architectural Review, which I assume was a at some point were separate magazines that were combined. And in that magazine, they had a number of articles that were published uh, under the, the name of the American Specification Institute. I, f I found out since, just today, that it started in 1922. And we think that it extended up until uh, 1961 or so. but. Um, we're a little unclear about this. As you can see from this, it says that the ASI was a member of ASTM, which is interesting. And it lists the, the Board of Governors there and, and everybody. And it's not clear. Um, I found also in um, Amazon, there's some a used bookstore that's selling one of the volumes of the bound publications of ASI. Um, and uh, Sheldon told me that he actually has two or three of those volumes in his personal library. We'll be talking to him uh, maybe later about that. Um, but let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. I did consult with um, Dick Eustace. Um, and ask him if CSI was an outgrowth of, the AS, of ASI. And he said he didn't think it was. That they, and as I say, it appears that they did overlap a little bit, because one went from 1922 to maybe 1961. And of course, CSI was founded in 1948. So there was a certain amount of overlap there. And, and of course, what they were looking for was an, uh, or more standardization, make it easier to find information. And even in those days, though it wasn't the information that we uh, needed to build a building was far less complex, there was still a need to be able to readily find that information on the part of both the architects and the, uh, uh, and the, the contractors alike. And so there were there was a perceived need to be able to come up with a system that would be more widespread and less idiosyncratic, varying from one office to another. So let's go to uh, the actual text from ASI and let them explain to you. What well, wait, well, wait a minute here. We need to make at least a comment about the three C's. Uh, we're going to get that. That Are comes you, later. That, that comes, comes later. To, oh, OK. I'm sorry Trust to rush me. you. Trust okay. <laughs> <laughs> so as it, you can see, they were pointing out that there was a, a lot of um, wasted effort that could be uh, spent better by more cooperation between people. And so incidentally, that magazine that I referred to also had a series of documents of or I should say, of technical articles, very detailed technical articles called the Specification Department that go into uh, great detail 
on all the technical requirements that would be required for a given specification section. Uh, there's one for concrete, for example, that they actually had to publish in, I think, three different uh, issues because it was just so lengthy, and it goes into great detail. It doesn't actually have sample text. It just it's more like the evaluation sheets from RCOM that tell you well, what decisions do you need to make and here's why you should choose one thing rather than another. So, um, now? Now we have the All three, right. All right. We have the three C's of specifications and their take on that was clear, concise, and coherent. And by coherent, I think they meant what we would today probably say coordination. And uh, let's go to the next slide that shows that in detail. And I like the way this is written. That pretty highfalutin stuff here. Every specification comprises certain elements that are necessary in order to convey to the mind of the reader fundamental desiderati. Actually, I thought that was a uh, Italian sports car from the early 50s that went out of business, but <laughs> sort of down at the like end. That. <laughs> yes, down at the end. So uh, whether it's a building, a piece of machinery, or or a pavement, uh, specifications are necessary, and they need to be clear, concise, and coherent. Now, um, uh, Sheldon t today sent me some. Um, other documents, um, and I have in front of me, we couldn't fit them into the, uh, get them in the presentation. Um, this is called the ins Intelligent Use of the Specification Record. And I'm going to read a short paragraph or single sentence from that, and it says, clear, concise, complete, and well-coordinated drawings and specifications should secure fair and intelligent proposals, should eliminate vexatious extras, and should eliminate also the necessity for verbal or supplementary written instructions. And that sounds, uh, that sounds a lot like what we would write today, except probably uh, CSI in all of its publications has never once used the word vexatious. Although I like that. I do. You know, it was a, it was a different language that was common uh, yes. going back some years, really. Yes. And sometimes you read some of these older articles, and it's actually uh, quite pleasant to see what command of English language some of these folks had compared to some of the text we see today. True. Um, and uh, let's, um, uh, Sheldon is on. Sheldon, would you raise your hand so we can recognize you? Because uh, you know a little bit m more about the ASI than I do. And why don't you talk about the, a little bit about the, the history or what you know of it. Am I live? You are. Hey, how about that? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. Myself. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, to introduce him, uh, Sheldon is a full-time specifier for a large firm in Minneapolis. Same and I hope you're having good weather up there. Um, okay. Well, the um, interesting, um, I know some of you have seen or heard of my, my, my spiel about evolution and demise of construction documents. Um, as part of that, I acquired some documents, and um, I got two volumes of the specification record that, um, that was mentioned before. And I also got uh, from my alma mater um, uh, some scanned in images from projects from back in the early 1900s. And uh, I, I had not even heard of the specification record before, and it just turned out that they were cleaning the library out over there, and the guy I used to work with wondered if I might be interested. So, but um, it's really interesting the, the forward there, and it tells you how to write specifications and everything. Um, it really is is like an abbreviated version of what we're teaching. 
today in our certification classes. So it was kind of interesting. And I've done a lot of poking around on the internet too and found a whole bunch of things that have been scanned in and everything. But um, And I might say that we're going to try to make all of these documents available. So if you want them, I'm not sure how we'll do it, but uh, uh, some of these historic documents I think you would like to read and um, we're going to make arrangements somehow for you to download uh, PDFs of them. Yeah, I figured I'd, I'd, I'd post them to my website and I can send you a link to that so you can make them available. Yeah, we'll make some more work for Matt. Let him take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Matt. Matt is our uh, staff liaison. Okay, shall we move on? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, uh, talking about the need for more information, and uh, one of the things that was published in that the book in that magazine was from time to time there would be whole lists of available catalogs that you could send away for, like the advertisement here that that you have, so that there's enough, so that. Uh, people would know where to get information because um, in the days before the uh, the internet obviously if you were in a small town out somewhere or even in a large city you might not know all the manufacturers that would have technical information that would help you write your specifications. In the time frame you're talking about this preceded suites catalogs Yes. We so, had a comment from, um, yes, it was, remember, uh, Sweets Catalogs used to be this, it uh, shrunk over the years, but I remember when I started in this business in the mid-60s, it was, it seems to me like it was about a five-foot length of uh, volumes. Um, Larry Whitlock comments that he believes coherent was intended to be logical and well-organized, easy to understand. Um, and that's true, but I think it also has the overtones of cohering that is hanging together and easy to understand. So, uh, yeah, it, that's a, a very good comment, Larry. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next slide. So there was a, uh, that was the need for the systematic study. Let's, and we need, there was a perceived need for an orderly system for organizing. So let's go to that slide. And I, this one I really like because, did you, David, did you know that you're a scientist? Many Unlike. days I feel, I feel like I have to be. I'm maybe not, maybe not a rocket scientist, but... <laughs> A specification scientist, unlike other branches of scientific endeavor. Wow, I like that. Should have realized the science and technique of specification writing. Didn't even mention art. <laughs> and uh, I like this, that to uh, produce a happy accomplishment of the work with a minimum of grief. That's certainly my goal in life. <laughs> I just love some of this wonderful old uh, uh, prose that these folks wrote for us. Okay, so fr some fr from now on, though, all of the specifiers in our audience, you know, your happy accomplishment, make sure you get a smiley face on the cover of your spec sheet. <laughs> and <st> <coughs> So there was a need for textbooks and unified study. And then it also, this is the first mention <coughs> that I've come across as the uh, concept for an office master. And let's go to that slide. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, no, this, I got them out of sequence. Okay, this has to do with the orderly arrangement because um, the specifications mixed up stuff where bronze work was in with carpentry or marble work or cabinetry or other things, and we don't want to disgust our subcontractors. No, because if they get uh, upset, 
or disgusted with the, the quality of the work, then the quality of their work is going to suffer too. That's right. So here's the, the concept for the office master. And you can see that I've actually I put a little ad there uh, for a certain type of, hot of project because that was the, the, the concept. And let's go to that slide, please. Sure. So, read up the catalogs and build up a general specification for, for different items and so that you're not having to sit down and rewrite a whole set of specs from start. And what did they mean by general? Because I know I'm going to talk about this in a little bit when we get there, but what do you think they meant? Oh, I think he meant an office master. Okay. That would have a wide range of information that you could then tailor to be project specific. Um, Sheldon Wolf uh, uh, sent in a comment saying the ASI specification record was about 500 pages long, nearly all of which was a collection of specifications, making it an early version of suite, so to speak. And then um, there's a list of institute goals. Oh, here's a l reference list of from that magazine, of just a partial list of some of the manufacturers that had uh, pamphlets or catalogs available. And you notice some familiar names in, in there. Connear is in there. And Knapp, Knapp and Vogt. And, uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> that's all right. But uh, you might not be able to just pick up your phone and uh, call the look in the yellow pages and find the local rep for con here. And if you needed some store information about storefronts, uh, you depended on, upon these magazines that would list the available catalogs like this. Now let's go to the next slide, please. So here uh, is our, this was written at the very inception of the Institute and lists what they were trying to accomplish, their, their work plan. So we have studying materials and methods of, of writing and um, accomplishing complete coordination between drawings and, and specs, um, develop a, of an outline or checking list. And we're going to see an example of that written by uh, Ben John Small, who is, of course, the patron saint of specifiers. Okay, when you're uh, talking about the Institute here, you're, this is ASI, this is not a, Yes, the American still. Specification Institute, because we're still in the 20s here. And CSI is not in even a gleam in anybody's eye. Um, general contracts, of conditions, and so forth. Oops, you went too oh, far. Sorry. Back there. It wasn't quite done. Okay. Um, and also, I want to... Um, the use of standard specifications as prepared by societies and manufacturers. Uh, again, trying to standardize requirements and arranging them for number six to conform to the sequence of construction. Uh, number seven, we have the three C's again here and writing so that it can be understood by the courts, which I think, amongst other things, that would take to mean being able to be understood by persons outside our industry, the AEC industry. Um, and a possible standardization of building codes. When I started in this business, even in, up until the late 70s uh, in Ohio, Ohio had its own separate building code that a committee somewhere wrote. And it was not until sometime in the 80s that um, Ohio signed on with BOCA and adapted the BOCA code to its use. And then, of course, uh, there were three major uh, code generating groups. And they eventually merged into the International Code Council, the ICC, that gave us the International Building Code. So that did eventually happen, but it, it was a a dream even back in the 1920s and a realization that it was something that was genuinely need, needed. And um, 
Yes, the activities of the institute that was the uh, American Specification Institute. Uh, and then, of course, um, the adoption of recommended practices by the profession. So not only do we want to have good ideas, but we want to have them used by people. And uh, so that, that was their set of goals. Let's do our first polling question. Since All right. we're talking about the ancient stuff. And let's see. We get to see how old our audience is, David. Oh, really? Okay, you're going to have to <laughs> fill me in here since I'm running the show today as to okay. where we are with the poll. All right. Well, our largest group is uh, Windows or Apple computer. Really? We have a young crowd. A little over a third. Uh, we do have a small group of 16% do remember mimeographs. 28% uh, remember ordinary typewriters and photocopiers. And uh, a, a small group remember the IBM Selectric with mag cards. And about the same number remember the DOS computers. OK. So what was your earliest memory? Oh, um, I. I didn't actually have to deal with it myself, but uh, uh, where I, when I started working in in an architect's office in the summer of I think 1967, uh, the specs specifications were reproduced by mimeograph. All right, that was my earliest too. But I was expecting you to say you were handwriting the specs. <laughs> no. since, since you're significantly older than everybody else on this call. <laughs> That is true. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I I want to take the discussion a little bit later. Oh, when uh, Sheldon says his for uh, Sheldon, another old bugger, says that his first specs were written in peach text on a CPM computer. I forgot about CPMs. <laughs> I told you you forgot a couple of items. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to the presentation. I think it's your turn to talk. Okay. Well, you know, immediately before the war, and you, depending upon your age, you may wonder which war, but I guess we'll fill you in and tell you we're talking about Second World War. So anything um, prior to, say, like 1942 to 45, we want to step into that sort of era. And some of the things that we were finding, uh, Lewis mentioned a little bit about this specification desk as a department for the specification writer. This comes out of a publication called Pencil Points. And there was, in New York City, there was a New York Building Congress. And they were actually publishing a couple of different things uh, and reporting on the status of uh, issues in the industry. They were reporting on things from AIA. I saw some that were uh, referencing even the Philadelphia AIA. So they were going outside of their immediate surrounds and still trying to keep the industry current as to what was going on. So what I want to do is take a look at uh, some of the things that were uh, showing up in pencil points and this specifications department. Um, so I picked David, out a few. Yes. David, just a minute. Uh, Matt, we're still showing the poll results. Yeah, I think, David, if you want to just um, move something on your screen, I believe it's on your end just needs to get refreshed. Really? Well, I have moved, and it's not doing anything? Nope. It still says it's sharing your screen, but we still see the poll on the screen right now. Um, maybe hit uh, pause and then re-show your screen. So it just forces it to re-update the signal. How is that? Yes? No? Not fixed yet. All righty. Well, let me see what I can try next. Poll. Closed. All right. I'm not sure how to fix it, Matt. 
You want right, to take well, what a couple we're back I'm, yep, I'm going to cheat the system for a second here. All right. We leave it in your capable hands. I got to tell you, it's uh, been an interesting challenge electronically lately. So there we are go. we back, uh, back to sharing? Back. We are. Okay. Back in business. Good. All right. So we're talking about the Department for the Specification Writer from Pencil Points. And I selected a couple of things to share with you from that. So the first is from Charles Kramer. And he was talking about uh, generally what, how you organize the specifications. So he was commenting about the specialization of trades. Now this is coming to you from the mid-20s, mid to late 20s about how the trades were becoming much more specialized and it was he was attributing a lot of it to the union activity at the time so that he was saying that the specifiers were being taxed to actually deal with the labor market because the labor market was becoming specialized that the specs also needed to be specialized so that the description of the work was going to match the subdivision of the work that was being that contractors were trying to subcontract. So in in his discussion, he's talking about the Masons were actually responsible for 30 different trade divisions. Now realize Masons today are not even close probably to the Masons of the 20s where masons were responsible also for plaster, you know, virtually any kind of a wet trade application. So it was brick, it was stone, it was plaster, it was setting a whole lot of different kinds of materials. And he was faced with uh, actually writing specifications based upon each one of these trade divisions. Uh, that's, a, that's a theme that we're going to be examining on up into the 1960s, and we're going to be talking more about that from, from different people. But that was something that was, I, I agree, I think it started after those early specs that we saw, and uh, but sometime in the 20s or 30s started to become the basic concept behind organizing specification sections. Right, because concept. Kramer, Kramer in his article, like he's referencing the New York Building Congress uh, for some of the things that they've published, but he actually has a list of these 55 different trade sections uh, that he was making reference to. And looking at those, he was suggesting that any one con uh, construction contract could, abs could absolutely have 100 subcontractors just based on the trade sections because of the multiple divisions below each one of the sections that he was uh, looking at as the main headings. So in trying to deal with all of that, trying to write the specs to match essentially trade sections. So here was one of his parting thoughts to his article uh, saying specs must be compiled so thoroughly that contracts and subcontracts can be executed directly from them without omission or overlapping the various traits. So he felt from the specifier's standpoint that in effect the specifications were directing uh, the subcontract assignments. So trying to keep everything squared away and not missing anything, not overlapping, in effect doing what the contractor is doing today by assigning the work. So it was a whole different level of responsibility falling to the specifier. There was another fellow, uh, Henry Hepps, uh, who was commenting about the technique of producing specifications. So he was basing his recommendations upon a study that he had done of different firms at the time. And again, this is the mid to late 20s. So he was trying to avoid the cut and paste using the last project. Of course, none of us today ever would 
even remotely consider doing that. I understand. Horrors. That. Yes. I mean, so uh, we're well beyond all of that. We this isn't even a consideration anymore. But what he although does, it's a lot easier with computers. <laughs> but it just speeds up the process. Absolutely. <laughs> So going back to your office master that you started talking about, Lewis, what, what Henry is suggesting was creating standard specification clauses, and that's why I was asking you about the general specifications, because the approach that Henry is suggesting is something I think very different than what I would consider to be a general specification. So he was suggesting using standard clauses and then creating schedules for the particular project. The reason being that if he has standard clauses, he could actually pre-publish all of those clauses and then reference those clauses from the schedule. Ah, I see. And I'll bet by clause he probably meant a, a actually a paragraph or paragraph and maybe one or two sub points that dealt with ah, a single yes. tight subject. Right. So you're seeing here that he's suggesting that you want to describe the materials and the location. You want to these these are the schedule items for the particular project. You want to describe the materials and the location for that project. Then reference the standard clause by its number, and in his case it was a page number. And what he did, I thought a unique thing that I hadn't seen anywhere else. He's suggesting that we use very small pages, three and a half by seven. The rationale, you can only get one item per page which makes referencing easier. You make the spec pocket size, I suppose, so you can carry it out to the field, to the job site. You mean like your smartphone? Yeah. Or you know, a steno notebook. You know, and that's something easy to carry. Uh, and Vivian Volz uh, has the comment that British specs use the clause method to, uh, today. Right, yeah, and they, the NBS, the National uh, British Standard, does exactly that. They identify each paragraph with its clause number. And Sheldon um, uh, comments that um, state departments of transportation also do something like that. They have this book, and then projects are specified by reference to it, and the modify, modifications is required. Uh, and he says definitely not pocket size, though, but in fact, I've seen many of the DOT books that are, uh, well, maybe coat pocket size, not shirt pocket size. Maybe and, uh, Vivian says, and Vivian says maybe we should resurrect it. She'd love to see us resurrect this concept. Well, you know, and maybe this is not such a bad idea when you well, look at it. Well, you know, it. I have sometimes thought about the future of specifications that want with um, moving to integrating information into BIM that maybe someday the um, the basic unit of specifications would be an article rather than a section. Well, so, it could very well be. But that well, sounds like a, t a topic for another uh, session to discuss. <laughs> that would be future specs, wouldn't it? Yes. Not then and now. So we're still stuck in then, and we're never going to make it through in an hour, Lois. You realize that. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, Dan had a question. What is BIM, I mean, Building Information Management Software? Um, Vivian says it would really work very well with uh, BIM. Our database-driven specs are hitting, hinting at this concept. But, but right. uh, finish your thought, David. Okay. So here's his sample. This is Henry's sample standard spec. So. The page number is 42.31. It's chimneys. So you can see this is his entire standard spec for chimneys. Would fit on the 3.5 by 7 card. So he can reference chimneys from just this page number. And you can see it doesn't get into a whole lot of detail here from by today's standards, but if you had a mason that understands how to build a chimney, maybe this is enough. 
then what he would do is, as a sample for his schedule items, now none of this is dealing with chimney, but these were the ones that he offered in yes. the article. <clears throat> so, and I see I can't type and get it right, can I? Exterior <laughs> walls foe the building. Okay. So those specifiers out there that are going to pick on my typing abilities, go ahead and now's your chance. Um, so here's the example where he's, lay, he's laying out the specifics for the project and then referencing back to this standard spec simply with the page number. Oh, now it's also interesting, David, I, that is the actual proprietary product is mentioned here in the schedule and the spec has more to do with the uh, manner of installation, doesn't it? Yes. And here, too, in the schedule, he's talking about this is where you're going to identify where and the where. products are being used. Because I, one of the concepts I try to do even today is if we can specify in a sentence where on the drawings, instead of having the drawings note every instance, we still have the scope covered. And we've done it much more efficiently. So Of course, a lot of people do a lot of people do that with sealants by describing which sealant, what applications it's used for so that we don't have to rely on the drafter to uh, uh, select the exact type of sealant to be used in each individual detail. Okay, so I want to take a jump forward to 1940. All right, Harold Reeves Sleeper published a book and the book is um, essentially a, a specification, a master specification. The book itself is probably about 550 to 600 pages. And the table of contents, you can see, we are at 66 divisions. And looking down through them, I think you can see at the time that these were done, it really does follow an awful lot of the trade uh, assignments. And it's really not all so much different than what we're doing today, just arranged maybe a little bit differently. We still have the MEP all falling at the end, and the, and the only thing that really falls after it in several different examples is elevators. Yes. So there is definitely a, a thought that specification should be organized in the sequence of construction. Right. So here's the sample of what uh, Sleeper was suggesting. So what you're seeing is somebody trying to use his book. The check marks at the left are the items that are included for the particular project where there's a choice to be made. You can see down here where it's talking about siding, it's followed by a dash, meaning that there's going to be a choice. So he has to choose one of these, whether it's bevel, bungalow, colonial, or such, to let the contractor know what he's going to furnish. So he just circles what he needs. The rest remains. You don't even have to cross it out. He circled what's required. Fill in the blanks for the other items to give them the, the particular quality that he requires for the particular project. Publish this as you see it here, and that's the project specification. So that's it's really, really, really that's not, clever. not anything different than what we're doing today, except that we're using electronics to edit this stuff instead of and markups. Oh, now he calls it a division, but we today would refer to that as a section. I think. Oh, right. And, and, right. and some of his contemporary writers, most of his contemporaries uh, who were writing about specs, would all call those sections rather than divisions. I think that's the the first time I uh, run across uh, the use of the term division. Okay, so here in his preface to the book, 
I just want to point out some of the things. The issues are identical. They haven't changed in 60 years. <laughs> no, they haven't. They really have not changed. You know, so they're talking about everything becoming more involved, more technical, more exacting. Pressure of time. Gosh, they don't have time enough to get everything done. Hard to keep yeah. things up to date. Yeah, the architect's handicapped by lack of reliable source material. Gee, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? The 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 end the end pieces of this that I have highlighted I thought were especially relevant because here Sleeper's saying talking about the architects and you can see he he did a study of some 60 what he calls well-established offices and he says the majority prepare new specifications by reference to their old ones copy the last one and reuse it few have their own standard specs and the ones that do admit they're not kept up to date is it any different today <laughs> no. yeah, we all struggle with the exact same things and then he's saying the others have started their standards, but they've never completed them. I, I really am not seeing any difference. You know, we're facing the exact same things today. So there it is. Everything's more involved, more technical. You have always the pressure of time, and you can't find the source material to help you. What else is there to say? Well, uh, Dan Ryan suggests we also struggle getting new products into specs. Okay, Lewis, we're down to like four minutes left here, and we're just jumping into post-war. We just finished World War II. Where do we? What do we want to do here? Take a break. Well, you have a, you have a couple more poll questions. Uh, but they really relate to uh, the later stuff. So, I think we could do new ones next time. We could th probably think up of some uh, new clever questions to ask our very erudite audience. Um, uh, David and I discussed early this morning that we had more stuff than we could get through in one session, so we're going to have to invite you to come back next week and find out what happened after World War II, the inception of CSI and how it got started and the differences between the early CSI experience and, and later CSI experiences and activities of, and so forth and how they differ and uh, where we are now. So we're hoping that most of you will be able to join us next month for that, and we go through this. And uh, if you have some suggestions or specific questions that you would like us to address, please uh, keep those cards and letters coming in, friends and neighbors. Well, and if you have samples of some of these older things that none of us, none of us have seen, Gosh, it, it's just interesting digging through the archives. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, as I say, um, um, w uh, Sheldon sent me a couple of things that we may work part of that into the uh, presentation for next week, next month. I want to leave you as a parting thing. I found, again, a digitized uh, copy of a five or 600-page book called Specifications for Practical Architecture, published in England by Alfred Bartholomew and Frederick Rogers. And I want to read just a, a one very lengthy and convoluted sentence as a, maybe as an afterword to today's session, where he says, it should be the glory of an architect's specification that it be so clear that the builders who are estimating from it the probable cost of the intended work may have to ask no questions, semicolon, that the specification contain an exact, comprehensive, and proper description of the work as it really can be and says, and as it ought to be executed, omitting nothing whatever which the architect's practical knowledge, experience, and foresight may tell him must be included in the work, semicolon, that the words of it be so chosen and so arranged that there be not the shadow of a doubt or ambiguity in any part of it, and that the whole of the intended work 
be completed without extra charge for things negligently omitted and without the possibility of a dispute upon the construction of any of the words of the specification. Is that the end of that sentence? <laughs> That's one sentence. He should have, that fellow should have uh, attended our last session. <laughs> last wow. session. I, can I shorten that sentence? Yes. Specification shall be perfect? <laughs> or at least clear, concise, correct, and coordinated. I and coherent. He was, he was asking for perfect. <laughs> he really was. <laughs> Okay, so let me see. When when are we meeting next month, Lewis? It's the and actually, Steve and Lewis, this is Matt. I was going to bring up next month would be scheduled for May 2nd, but Dave, I know that you and I will be driving to Gettysburg for the Mid-Atlantic region that day. Um, no, I so won't. Perhaps we should shoot for the 9th? Well, that would be up to you, Matt. I can uh, I can be available. Actually, I'll be exhibiting at an AIA show that day. Uh, okay. So I can be available if, if it's possible for you to do it, if you want to look at your schedule and we can let everybody I, know. I can make it work if we want to stay on schedule for that first Tuesday. So that would be May 2nd. Then. Okay. Let's, let's try we'll, to keep it there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll pick up at the post-war publications next month, May 2nd. Yeah, that, that makes a good... Uh, uh, division dividing point. Okay. So uh, thanks to everyone who uh, joined us to, today, and I hope that you found this uh, both fun and interesting, and perhaps a little bit encouraging in the sense that uh, you know we're still struggling and facing the same issues that people did more than a hundred years ago, and uh, uh, we're the heirs to a great and noble tradition of stringing words together to try to communicate complex technical information in a legally enforceable way. And when we get to the end, maybe we'll get Sheldon to tell us how to make everything perfect now. Oh, I have some, I have a, a, a real zinger for him uh, next month. So everybody turn, be sure and uh, rejoin in. us so that you can yes. see that. Because you, All right. Sheldon's going to love this. <laughs> okay, I can't wait to see what you're going to get him with.